Emma Jane Park. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? I'm okay. Good. Tell us first of all a little bit about what you do, just briefly. Um, I am a dancer, theatre maker, collaborator and arts activist is the phrase I like to use, um, which can be reactions, big actions, but always something with a bit of socio-political edge and a bit of an advocate for the arts generally. Okay, amazing. So how is success characterised? I know it's a, it's a massive question, um, and I think I think there's different lenses is the best way to measure it. So for me myself, and I would say my peers, um, success is being able to have a meaningful and ethical practice, um, and doing things deeply and convincingly. Um, whereas from a ex more external kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think success is touring and performing work and having shows on in spaces that are really visible. Right, press coverage, all of those kind of things. I think particularly about my family who aren't yeah, so yeah. connected to the arts. Mm -hmm. They think it's much more successful when I'm doing a gig at the Lyceum than because when I'm it's talking about doing more other things. Yeah, it's right. visible and it's really clear. It's a yes. clear entity. You're doing a thing that yes. they understand. Um, but, and then, it, but in reality it's not clear like in terms of the, the range of things you do yeah massively it's not clear and I think the other big mark of success is that you just are surviving doing it and making a living Fair. across the board uh, <laughs> my dad is happy if I get paid ever that's always a good thing for him um, and my peers are are impressed I suppose uh -huh. if you're if you're doing the thing and you're yeah. working regularly um, for me there's not that much time to dwell on it Mm -hmm. To be honest, mm -hmm. you just know when you're happy and you know when you're not. Mm -hmm. It's a good, me it's a good yeah. measure. It's a good measure. So, what are the typical issues or barriers that somebody faces at the point where they're engaging with one of the fields that you work in? Um, I think the barriers are the same across the board. Mm -hmm. um, sustainability is a huge issue because um, there's not a lot of space to step back and reflect. And that can be really complicated because it either it either takes you out of the project, so it means you can't dig in as deeply or work as meaningfully as you want to, mm -hmm. um, because there's not space around that, or or it means that you just you're having to just churn things out, and you're so busy worrying about the next thing and how you're just gonna make ends meet, yeah, as opposed to being able to breathe and rest, yeah, um not being able to rest is a massive barrier and a lot of people discuss that as a choice mm -hmm. for people that don't have a fallback or another way of sustaining themselves there's no choice involved you you have to keep going and try and mm -hmm. pay the bills um, and I think that endurance and resilience are tied into that as well mm -hmm. because you're sold the dream as a student but also as an emerging artist you're sold the dream that it gets easier mm -hmm. And it doesn't. Your network gets wider. Mm -hmm. um, you feel like less of an imposter potentially. Um, mm -hmm. The more you occupy the spaces that we occupy, but it's the same wow. system over and over again. I was sold the the RFO dream that you work so hard for a while and Explain then you'll become. What that is. Sorry, the RFO is a regularly funded organisation, um, which in Scotland there is a portfolio of organisations across the arts mm -hmm. and all art forms, um, and support organisations who receive a set amount of money from Creative Scotland. That is not enough to pay for everything they do. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. I totally advocate for public support. Um, but we were sold as younger artists that you work for a while, you build your portfolio, mm -hmm. and then what you'll eventually do is you'll apply, and that kind of support will mean you can plan over a good few years, mm -hmm. and you'll have a team of people mm -hmm. all skilled in their individual area of expertise, and that money will help pay for them, mm -hmm. which will create some level of sustainability. Mm -hmm. For artists of my generation, that's no longer thing mm -hmm. or a dream or a reality or even from my perspective and um, something that I think I would want there's a right. massive amount of paperwork mm -hmm. attached right. to that and <laughs> um, I am a bit of an activist so I'm responsive mm -hmm. so that means sticking to your three-year plan and I like to be organized and I like to stick to the plan but I'm, I also uh -huh. enjoy that little punk in me enjoys going <laughs> I know that's the plan but we're just going to bend that plan massively okay. <laughs> um, so yeah there's there's something about that being the vision of sustainability being mm -hmm. removed that's really worrying because yeah. basically you work project to project mm -hmm. and who knows mm -hmm. and all the unpaid work in the middle mm -hmm. is the biggest barrier because it's what exhausts you mm -hmm. it's not necessarily working within your skill set mm -hmm. 
Um, so for me, I've become a self-producing artist and I'm mm -hmm. all right at it. Mm -hmm. That's not where my skills lie. I work really hard to do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which absolutely drains me. Tell me what you mean by that, that self-producing artist then. What does cool. that mean? So um, basically I'm responsible for fundraising for projects I want to run, responsible okay. for administering mm -hmm. a lot of those projects, um, responsible for building the network that enables those projects. Mm -hmm. Some of those things, meeting with people, chatting things through, mm -hmm. figuring out who it's best to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that sits within my skill set. Mm -hmm. Drawn up budgets. Mm -hmm. I can do, but I have to be in a certain headspace and it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, strategic planning mm -hmm. is, again, I'm like, it's something I can do, but it exhausts me in a really different way. Yeah. Um, and I become very administrative. And as someone who moves, that's the biggest part of my practice, uh -huh. to sit down in a seat and suddenly pour all of your energy into your brain mm -hmm. actually, I think, makes me worse at the thing that I do best. Mm -hmm. um, so I said this, I was presenting at a session a few weeks ago about uh -huh. communicating dance uh -huh. and I said to them quite openly this will be much more difficult than it would have two months ago when I was in a three-month period of touring making collaborating with people and being in a studio because when I'm doing the thing uh -huh. I can talk about doing the thing uh, okay. off the cuff really yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah. I was presenting at a time when I'd done two or three funding applications uh -huh. and I've submitted seven over a month's period yeah pretty intense um, yeah. and so I'd suddenly become much worse at discussing communicating dance because I wasn't dancing uh -huh. um instead I'm talking in jargon a lot of the time mm -hmm. um and assuming lots of things about projects as opposed mm -hmm. to doing them and trying and testing out mm -hmm. what we do mm -hmm. so yeah there's something about I think it's great that I have an understanding of what it means to produce mm -hmm. but I think that makes our jobs unsustainable because it it is really exhausting and really draining for someone to do something that isn't instinctive and natural mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, in terms of any entrepreneur, we'll talk about the different heads that you have to wear. But yeah. I think what we're seeing here is that because of your practice, there is a very specific thing that you set it up to do, to let you do, and that it's all kind of channeled towards that. But that proportionally, it sounds like that is very heavily weighted project by project yeah. whether you have the time to do the thing that is your practice okay that's yeah. it okay the time and the the specific thing about the kind of theater i make or dance mm -hmm. is that it relies on big safe spaces that bodies can be in right um and i don't, it's not like a value judgment on other art forms i'm just saying they instinctively are different i have a lot of friends who are poets mm -hmm. they can work in a space on their own with a mm -hmm. notepad and pen and their research mm -hmm. and that's possible Whereas I generally, because I make work with other people, need to be in a studio space mm -hmm. with another body. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And various other things. And yeah. so that that itself just just makes it harder to find a way to support that. And loads of people are happy to get in a studio with you for free. But yeah. ethically, I don't feel great about asking people to work unpaid. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair. And that, I mean, that's a huge question, isn't it? The ongoing, yeah. if there's a lack of sustainability at all sorts of levels in a field, then obviously that changes the opportunities that are available to those who are emerging into that field because there's only X amount of stuff to go around. That there's, yeah, I totally get the, as a director the thing of going, you have to have people. If you don't have people, how am, how am I doing my job if there's not a room full of people? But I equally have spoken to art, you know, visual arts workers who just like, shut up, you don't have to take a van of stuff. Like, you just arrive and it's your own self. And that, yeah. so I think it, you're right, every... It swings and roundabouts. Uh, you know, absolutely. But, uh, jewelers, I didn't realise how hardcore jewelers are because they, like, set fire to stuff. Yeah. And, like, do you know what? There wasn't a client and you're like, oh, yeah, so you're working with, like, acid and fire in the domestic space. That's not That's not good. Yeah. So, yeah, there's there's obviously se sector by sector. Everybody has their things. So when... When we talk about then what you do, so when you, when you and I, where we before you came in to see cultural enterprise, before yeah. you came in and it was me that you got you came in to see. We didn't know that, and I didn't know you. But before you came in, what were you doing, and where were you at? So I, my goodness, that is a while it's a ago. A while ago. Um, but I do remember it quite vividly because I was I was teaching quite a lot. Mm -hmm. That's a a revenue stream. In uh -huh. dance, mm -hmm. um, 
because I suppose that's a product that can yes. be sold in terms yep. of dance. So I was teaching quite a lot um, and loving it. I yeah. love the craft of teaching. I love mm-hmm. being around people. Mm-hmm. Um, I was auditioning as a performer mm-hmm. and I was starting to make my own work as well as dipping my toe in this kind of advocacy activism mm-hmm. thing um, and trying to understand what that was and how important that was both in the art sector but also societally mm-hmm. how important that could be mm-hmm. um, and I was at a place where I think yeah I totally remember multiple websites and how do you discuss those things with people and in certain worlds mm-hmm. I was known as a teacher um, mm-hmm. I got quite a, a, conver- a phone call from the company that I did my apprenticeship with, Company Cordelia, a Glasgow-based mm-hmm. company. I can remember the artistic director phoning and saying, oh, someone's told me that you would you would make a great education officer. But I'd say to them, like, I didn't realise you do that because they thought of me as a performer because right. I did my apprenticeship with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and just having that, that massive realisation that actually I could look like a bit of jack-of-all-trades to people, but mm-hmm. also either that or I'm visible for doing one thing mm-hmm. that means I'm not seen for opportunities mm-hmm. um, that are actually something I also do. Mm-hmm. So I saw myself as being kind of multiple strands of stuff mm-hmm. and then either perceived as one of those strands mm-hmm. or a bit of a muddy field in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really frustrating. I had loads of loads of websites, loads of... Loads of websites. Loads of web, websites and social Ooh. media stuff and it was a bit like, how do you... How do you... Um, how do I communicate those things was the yeah. question I was asking because to me it was definitely just me and just one thing yeah. that was really important um, but was a bit muddy to other to people. people on the outside and you were being therefore approached and commissioned by lots of different people who wanted different things from you Yeah. so there was a real reason why there was if you like lots of strands to your yeah. marketing yeah and I think I'm, I think I'm dead I, I was going to say I'm dead lucky. It's not a luck thing. Because um, it's just how you value different things. I'm the kind of person who works from a value set and is uh-huh. interested in multiple things uh-huh. and will push quite hard to pursue each of those things as a craft. So I, I value teaching as a craft. And yeah. I value people that teach it. All they do is teaching. Yeah. And they really dig into that. And I I believe that if you're someone that teaches, you have a responsibility to pursue that kind of knowledge mm-hmm. and have that kind of practice in there, like a really deep practice. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm not the person that goes, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. For me, the thing is, is the communication and it's the values behind the communication and it's kind of like the political edge to the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the form, I'm not that. Yep. I don't want to say I'm not bothered, but I'm not that married to form. To one particular. Which is why yeah. I, I navigate between dance and theatre and sometimes some of my work people are like, it's a bit live arty. And I'm just like, yeah, but that's what that's what said it most strongly yeah. if I can say it in a sentence I'm not about to dance at you for 40 minutes because so you were multilingual you basically arrive and you're multilingual is that yeah. makes sense? you said to me in our first appointment that you had been in America at a, the whacking the whacking and vogue festival the whacking yeah. and vogue festival I had to go and google this after yeah. you left I sat down and went oh it has two eights I had yeah. to like <laughs> go look it up that there was, and you told me about a guy who was very successful and it got cleaned the subway in New York yeah. as a, and you kind of held him up as this example of why this was something that spoke to your soul but was impossible to monetize. Yeah, is that yeah? Yeah, totally. Um, and I always, I think for me, I always respected the fact that he didn't monetize it. So he was like, "This is how I sustain myself, and this is my love, and I give everything to it." Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a bit envious because part of me at that point in time again was juggling with sustainability, and it was like. I'm lucky that I can be paid to do the thing I love, but actually then you get into that muddy ground of sometimes I don't know if I'm taking the jobs that are my dream job. And I, mm-hmm. I started to fall out with myself a little bit, actually, because I, I would be teaching some classes and I love mm-hmm. teaching um, younger children. I love being around younger children, mm-hmm. but I'm not a week-to-week teacher. Mm-hmm. And there's a difference. I like doing intensive projects where you're in with a really specific yeah. aim and you kind of blow everything out of the water and wobble with the rules a lot yeah and then you wrap it up nicely and you move on like I use the phrase permanent visitor a lot because it's like I'll always be there I'll always advocate for you Mm -hmm. I'm not coming back every Thursday at six o'clock because that that kind of routine doesn't sit well with me Mm -hmm. and also I I forget to fuel myself Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was in a few teaching jobs like that and I was giving them everything I could but I could feel myself becoming exhausted and I just thought to myself it's dead unfair Mm -hmm. that this is someone's dream job like this is I speak to people and this is their dream Mm 
mm-hmm. to do this every Thursday at six o'clock. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I shouldn't be doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I do. It's a really ethical, it's, and I'm not surprised because if you have an, eth- you come from an ethical position from ev- for everything, and I, it's one of the more interesting conversations to have with a client where you can say, yeah, there are ways in which a sum can happen here that yeah. gives you an income. However, there are criteria that are not just about making the buck. Therefore, what are the things that are key? Because ultimately, it's interesting, people arrive with these things and often think that they're problematic and they're almost always the heart of the business. Yeah. They're almost always when someone says, but the thing is, it has to be blah, blah. They're telling you the thing that is absolutely key yeah. to what they're doing. and. I, I remember we did a long, I mean, it was a long appointment because it was, you know, we had a, it was a long talk. <laughs> I think we chatted longer than we were meant to, we just kept that. <laughs> Surprise. But I think that, you know, the, the th- so here's a question is what brought you through, what brought you through the door? What ultimately, you, you made an appointment with somebody yeah. you didn't know. Do you know, actually, I'd been part of the Cultural Enterprise Office coaching Okay. I'm going to say coaching project, but I can't remember what the word is. Yes, are no, products. coaching, so the coaching project the, yeah, is fair. Yeah, coaching project. Um, and I'd been to a couple of cultural enterprise um, sessions about funding, you know, they're quite like specific yes. sessions. training sessions. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I just felt kind of comfortable with the organisation, mm-hmm. for one. So there was a trust there that whichever stranger I met, mm-hmm. there would be a certain approach to mm-hmm. work and it made me feel really comfortable. Um. And also just this idea of having some focused time to think about the stuff more reflectively Mm because it's very easy to meet with someone and talk about a project. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very easy to talk about specifics, but related to this sustainability kind of conversation, very rarely do you get to sit and go, actually, what's the strategic plan? What what is all of this together? Mm -hmm. And what is 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. And what is useful and what isn't useful? And... How do we how do we talk about this in a way that adds value, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to constantly being like, "Oh, my website's out of date again. <laughs> I've just done it. And it doesn't work." Um, and which although, is often the thing. And although we did get to the point where we were talking about the strategic plan, yeah. we did start with the thing we said the symptom of what's wrong is I have this many websites. Yeah. And and we kind of started there. Yeah. And then got into a much bigger conversation about what was publicly lauded but didn't actually pay the bills i remember being part of it was that there were things that you could do for touring but financially they were a reach and they needed funding and they needed subsidy um i suppose the question and this is a big question for me because i never know so it's a bit like being a director choreographer you never know if your room's weird you don't know if your room is weird because you're always in it and people come in and out (laughs) of your room but what Going away from that session, then, was there a difference in your thinking or in what you did that came from? I know it's really hard to pinpoint something so far back. Do you but, know it is and it isn't because, as I like, I've, I think I've told you before, that's the that was the moment where the the company and I say company in inverted commas, mm-hmm. um, commas, 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 <laughs> um, in inverted commas because still not a company that's mm-hmm. always on the to-do list is okay. to register as something formal um, and I think part of that is this internal resistance because mm-hmm. part of me loves the flexibility mm-hmm. um is I came away with the company name or the the brand or the mm-hmm. handle or whatever you want to say um and that brought clarity um okay. so this notion of of celebrating the fact that I'm a bit of a mongrel and being able to clearly articulate that actually what I do is create from a value set Mm -hmm. and I'm not so married to form and have confidence in saying that Mm -hmm. was what I came away with and that was massive Mm -hmm. because that enabled me to relax okay um I've still over the past few years had issues of just doing too much and wanting to do everything and Mm -hmm. be a region that I can't do a billion massive projects that I want to um but that sent me on a journey to really refining and shedding things and being bold enough to say actually Thursday at six o'clock is someone else's dream job, so mm-hmm. I'm better doing another job that creates an income mm-hmm. that I don't love so much, mm-hmm. um, and letting them have their dream job and leaving that space open mm-hmm. in the hope that someone does the same for me, like in the hope that other people, if it's not their dream dream job, find an exit strategy and make space. Because mm-hmm. I just I'm I'm from the faith that if we're all doing our dream job, the world will just be a kinder, better place. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I it's going to be less arguments, peak time traffic. Yeah, because folk won't be as rigid. Um, yeah. 
So <laughs> hopefully. No, that's fair. Know. It's a philosophy for um, life. Yeah. <laughs> so I left with clarity in terms of what I needed to let go of, but yeah. also clarity in terms of going, I know this might be confusing yeah. to you, but this is actually what I do. This is how I yeah. describe myself. Mm -hmm. um, and the simple act of doing that Mm -hmm. has given me license to do all of those things okay so to be really clear yeah because i suspect that someone who wasn't in that appointment won't quite have caught that so you went from not having a company name to having a company name yeah. within the session yeah and some of that i think then comes from because you told me a lot of stuff and walked yourself to that answer yeah right I was going to say you maybe walked with me. You steered me. I did walk with you. I think but also it. a lot of reflecting, and I think that that also possibly is why something like those sessions are really valid to someone who doesn't count themselves as a wordsmith. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. Words aren't my weapon. Mm -hmm. They're not my weapon of choice. Um, often, but I am relatively articulate. Or in this situation, mm -hmm. I can spitball, and I'm happy to figure it out publicly. Mm -hmm. and that's cool like mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of going what here's a bunch of stuff I sound like I've gone on 900 tangents oh but now I can say it in a sentence yes. sorry about that <laughs> whereas I'm never going to say it in a sentence clearly if you leave me in a room on my own mm -hmm. to try and figure it out myself and I spent years doing that and I still do a bit because you want to get it right mm -hmm. and you want things to be right um, mm -hmm. which is to me hilarious in a creative sector because we work in a sector based upon failure and experimentation absolutely <laughs> <laughs> and I feel, I feel like somewhere along the way that's been massively forgotten or that's like we, we try and, and push that away and we try and skirt against that yeah um so for me that session was great because I could come in and just spitball mm -hmm. to the point where you then would just either reflect what I'd said mm -hmm. or rephrase what I'd said as a question so I would dig into it more mm -hmm. so I gradually batted away mm -hmm. all of the extra information and came down to this cultured mongrel mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. and feeling really cool with the word mongrel and just being like yeah that that makes sense that totally makes sense to me that is what I am and that's what I'm happy being um mm -hmm. and to this day I like people will ask often about the name of the company because mm -hmm. it is a question and sometimes in a good way sometimes in a not as good way and mm -hmm. I'm always really confident in mm -hmm. in my description of that and what that means and again and the other thing because I remember coming into session saying part of the reason for that and looking for that handle was because I'm interested in asking people to work with me not work for me and at mm -hmm. that point in time I was started to make a lot of touring work mm -hmm. and there's a bit of a thing in dance where people name their company after themselves which is totally fine mm -hmm. it just never felt right for me mm -hmm. one sort of very like interesting name I don't like it's the most standard name <laughs> you could have Emma Jane Park do you know what I mean it's you never have to spell that for folk <laughs> um but more so because I hate this notion that like, you work for me or you're my dancers or any of those things. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, do you want to come on board under this mm -hmm. value set and under this umbrella? Mm -hmm. And then you can work for Cultured Mongrel, you work with Cultured Mongrel, mm -hmm. but you have equal ownership of it in a way. So mm -hmm. for example, at the minute we're in Hill Head Library because I'm working on a project here um, and James that's working here classes himself as part of the Cultured Mongrel team. Yeah. And that's great. Mm -hmm. Um because that's more of the way, the ethos I suppose I grew up in mm -hmm. and the way I was brought up mm -hmm. to see things work. Mm -hmm. Which if it's a company that you're building around you, I think the thing is that that's all any solo entrepreneur can do. Whatever field they're in is build the company around them. And again, I think it's that thing of whatever people bring that they're not even aware that they're bringing sometimes. I mean, you were able to say, I have this kind of value set, this is important to me. Yeah. A lot of the time people will go, doesn't everyone? And you go, well, let me just pull some more of this out because nothing is a done deal. Do you yeah. know, lots of people come in with different things that are important to them. But if it's built around you, and it has to be built around the individual, then it has to be something that reflects that individual with sort of, you know, with clarity and with some, in a situation that allows people to say an informed yes. Because yeah. I think if you're collaborating with people, you want them to have an informed yes as opposed to a yes to the dream of whatever this is or yes to my pal or yeah. yes to yeah that's actually really important to me that's something that I don't know if it be stemmed from this or just from a realization when I started to then the way I audition actually mm -hmm. now is massively driven by that informed yes mm -hmm. um so I will open call Mm -hmm. which is great the last project was almost six months so there was a lot of responses mm -hmm. because as a dancer six months of work is like 
the dream. Um, <laughs> yeah, six months paid work is a rarity. Yeah. Um, but what I do after the open call and kind of refining it to a shortlist is Skype interview before we get in a room and I see you dance. Okay. Because and that's more and people will be like Skype interview and I'm like actually it's not it's a conversation or it's equally you interviewing me mm-hmm. and I'll start by going so the reason we're having this chat is so you know this is how the company works this is the mm-hmm. deal this will be the expectation on the road this will mm-hmm. be the way the room works it's actually quite fluid mm-hmm. um, digging into the fact it's a devised process and stuff which mm-hmm. I think is fine and people mm-hmm. know the process they like to work with but also digging in to the value set behind it and the fact that if we are touring in a space you're going to be just as interested and connect as much with the cleaner of the space as mm-hmm. you are with the artistic director mm-hmm. because if that doesn't work for you mm-hmm. we're going to have a really rough mm-hmm. four months on the road mm-hmm. um, because that's the value set and that's yeah what I would hope is being delivered and shared and taken places mm-hmm. um, and so that happens before we see people dance so the eight people you've got in a room dancing mm-hmm. um, have already said that informed Jess and yeah. then it's about the project so you're and doing the you're work doing. you're not doing the work of setting up the company room yeah. you're doing the work that's a, yeah. yeah pretty yeah. much it's about this is so you know how the room's going to work yeah. and then we'll, we'll reflect on that and we'll find it together because we're all individuals mm-hmm. but we're kind of coming from a similar place mm-hmm. as opposed to getting in the room and being like oh no <laughs> <laughs> We have totally different expectations and that's really awkward. Yeah. And that's something I'm trying to fight for a lot in my work, which is making it even less sustainable at the minute, <laughs> um, or more difficult, is ways to build that and build that safe space and build that room mm-hmm. at the start of a project and have time mm-hmm. um, to build that trust with a company of people. I don't, I don't know any theatre that is made by getting a bunch of the people who are in the right cast and bracket in a room and just pointing and telling them what to do anymore. Yeah. Like the performer is a monkey and the yeah. director is a ringleader is an old to me yeah is Fair. archaic yeah um so i think that's really important and mm-hmm. as, especially as equity are having all these conversations about safe spaces yes is the extreme end of that that i mm-hmm. absolutely advocate for but for me there's also the the nuanced end and the soft mm-hmm. end and part of that is about going this is actually the value set and this is the subtlety mm-hmm. in how we address each other is everyone cool with that? Because if that's not your process, mm-hmm. you're either going to have to get on board with it for eight weeks, mm-hmm. or maybe this isn't the job for you, and mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is also okay. Yes, <laughs> that's um, a big thing for people really to say yes when to, people yeah? are scrapping about yeah. trying to make ends meet. Yeah. But you're right, I think there's a thing that sits underneath all of the work that people take. Everybody's had one of those jobs that they've taken, and then gone, I've compromised myself too hard for this, or I'm not fit with this room. Yeah. And then, although that it sounds like the thing that you're doing is labour intensive and takes time, in reality, it saves so much time once you are in the process of making the work, because you don't have that drag of, we have to invent a room now, we have to invent a room that we can all say yes in, there's only so much flex that everybody yeah. has, and how is everybody doing that day? And we're going to be totally time pressed, because yes, we're all because... saying we can make work in four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then take it and then get it on a stage which is a lie which is also insane um yeah yeah totally insane so by that point in time we're all just gonna put up with whatever because there's no time <laughs> to deal with. so it's, it's a thing you've got to fight for and it's really complicated in terms of funding processes to fight for that time and i feel like i'm constantly trying to find clever ways to mm-hmm. do that so when i made experts in short trousers um, which was a work for young audiences and their families we mm-hmm. opened that with a clowning masterclass for the week so myself and the cast mm-hmm. were being led by someone else and mm-hmm. we were just in a workshop together mm-hmm. for a week um, and that was really vital mm-hmm. to to find in a common ground to kick off from mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and the bigger the projects are getting the harder it is to find time to argue for that space yeah and um, even if i've got a week and yeah. i've got to produce something day one is like set the space day yeah and I, like, for me, I'm really invested in that because I think mm-hmm. it's the safest way forward. But it's coming back to this kind of session where you can sit and have that chat and spitball it and figure out that value mm-hmm. that gives me the confidence to go, no, I'm, I'm going to apply for that. And in the funds that I'm going to say, we yeah. need a week to get to know each other mm-hmm. because we're working with quite fragile yeah. stuff or yeah. intimate stuff yeah. um, and it's unsafe otherwise. Mm-hmm. So let, let me do that. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, you are, we all think of ourselves as beginners, but the fact is that you are becoming more and more experienced. You know, you're not the same yeah. person as, as I had the, in, the appointment yeah, totally. with me. If you had a piece of advice, entrepreneurial advice, 
I don't know how I feel about that word. I know, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I said business advice and I'm like, no, it's not about the, like art is business, business is that, it's not. Yeah. If So perhaps if you had some advice about starting out or sustainability, does that make any yes. sense? But Do you have a piece of advice for anyone that's listening? Um, rest. Okay. Rest when you need it and don't be scared to stop and breathe. Emma Jane Park, thank you ever so much. That was great. Thank you so much. <laughs>